This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Rebecca Larson. From Empress Matilda and her cousin Stephen to the Wars of the Roses, Richard III and Henry VII, the throne of England has quite the history of usurpers. On today's episode, I invite author Matthew Lewis to discuss his love and knowledge of the time period. And he'll tell us who had the greatest motive to kill the princes in the tower. I'm Rebecca Larson, host of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast and owner of TudorsDynasty.com. Telling the stories of those who lived centuries before us is what I enjoy doing most. Whether it be a show on one subject or an interview with an author or historian, I'll bring you the tales of 16th century England. Before I get started today, I need to take a minute to thank all the folks who became new patrons since my last podcast. Carla M., Christina R., and Jennifer M. A full list of current patrons can be found at TudorsDynastyPodcast.com. If you'd like to become a patron, you can do so by going to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudors Dynasty and click become a patron. For as little as $3 per month, you can show your support. And with that, let's hear from Matthew Lewis. Matthew, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. Pleasure to be here. When I first became interested in English history, it was the Wars of the Roses, which first drew me in. What was it for you? It was the same, I think. I I did Wars of the Roses for A-level history, which is the the exams we all sit at 18 here in the UK. Um, And I had a fantastic history teacher. Um, I suspect that she was probably a closet Ricardian. She never told us as much. But some of the things she said when I think about them now... Um, about looking carefully at the evidence and thinking about where it came from. Those are all the things that stuck in my mind. Um, but I think if you, if once you start studying the Wars of the Roses, it just grabs hold of you, doesn't it? There's so much going on, so much interesting and exciting and fascinating and complicated and impossible to understand stuff that it never lets go of you. Matthew, you've written several books. Um, which was your first one? My first book was actually a, a fictional account of Richard III's life called uh, Loyalty. And it was kind of a a passion project. It was just something I did and it it got put on the back burner for years and I'd pick it up and put it down and pick it up and put it down. I eventually finished it um, and sort of put it to one side and thought, yeah, you know, I did that because I wanted to do it. You know, it helped me to to learn more about Richard III to research it. Um, Put it to one side and and a few people said to me, oh, you know, you should send it off to publishers and things like that. And I was like, well, no, it's it's rubbish. I don't want to put it in front of people, you know. One of the things I've I've found about writing is that putting your work out there and in front of people is the most frightening thing that you can do um, because so many people are so quick to judge and shoot it down for whatever reasons. And I just, at that point, I wasn't ready to put it in front of anybody. But a few of my friends read it and were telling me it was good um, and kept suggesting I send it off to publishers. And I thought, do you know what I'll do? I'll, I'll teach you all. I'll show you all how bad this book really is. I'll stick it on Amazon I'll self-publish it to Amazon for Kindle and things. um, And you'll see it won't sell a single copy. So I self-published it to Amazon and it spent six months up there during which I think it sold five copies. And then they dug up Richard III remains in 2012 and it just went nuts. Um, The book suddenly sold lots and lots and lots of copies. Um, It was getting lots and lots of attention. I ended up writing a sequel to that, which was my second book. Um, which kind of follows on from the Battle of Bosworth. I started a blog, um, which was really because of all of the stuff that was going around in the media after Richard III's remains were found. A lot of it just isn't true. It isn't correct. Um, So I wanted to try and correct some of those misunderstandings and the misinformation that was out there. And a publisher then got in touch through my blog and said, you know, we really like your style of writing. Would you like to write a a book for us? Um, I kind of picked myself up at the floor and said, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and I think my, cracky, where am I? My 12th book for a, a publisher, 12th nonfiction book came out a couple of days ago. So that's pretty frightening. It's been a bit of a whirlwind. Wow, that is quite an achievement. That is amazing. To start out with your, your first book, where I, I think all of us have that same fear of our, our writing is rubbish and nobody wants to read it and it's horrible. Yeah. To have it go from selling five books to then f- them digging up Richard III to making it a bigger success. Like, I what mean, great in, timing. In terms of- yeah, in terms of marketing employees, you know, I couldn't have paid for anything better. 
than Richard the Third being dug up six months after I've self-published a, a stupid novel about Richard the Third. You might uh, owe him some royalties. I think I might do. You know, I'll pop down to his tomb again and say thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll pop a, a little shot of whiskey or something on top of his tomb. But yeah, so so I always say to anybody that talks to me about writing now and, and they say the same thing, that they're terrified of it and they don't want to put work out there, I just say to everybody, do it. Just do it. Now, the worst that can happen is that people don't like it, which is upsetting and it's horrible. But nine times out of ten, you'll find it's an awful lot better than you think it is. That's great advice. I like that. You mentioned briefly that you had a new book that just came out. Could you tell everybody about that? Uh, nothing to do with the Wars of the Roses. Uh, visiting a slightly different civil war, uh, heading back 300 years in history. Um, so what's a few centuries between friends? Uh, so I've gone back to Stephen and Matilda and the anarchy. Um, so looking at the the problems in the aftermath of the death of Henry I, uh, who had left the throne to his only legitimate daughter, uh, Empress Matilda, uh, only for Henry's nephew, Stephen, to, to snatch the throne when Matilda was quite slow to make a move for it. And then we ended up with 19 years um, from 1135 to 1154, of what, what is now called the anarchy, um, during which Stephen and Matilda had this kind of backwards and forwards for the throne. And it goes through periods of kind of Cold War. It heats up very quickly and you get some explosive action and then it, it freezes out again for, for longer periods of time. Um, so really interesting and quite a lot of parallels to the Wars of the Roses, I think, about what you do in a situation in a country where you've kind of got a choice of ruler. that That's unusual. And it makes it difficult when... How, how do you be a king and how do you enforce your will when they've got someone else that they can go to uh, and turn their back on you and, and this person might give them what they want instead? It makes it really, really hard to maintain royal authority in a similar way to, to what we had in the Wars of the Roses between first Henry VI and Richard, Duke of York, and then Edward IV and Henry VI. Um, so I think there's some parallels there, but a very different time period too. And uh, I think it would be fair to say that none of the conflict would have happened had it not been for the tragedy of the white ship. Absolutely. That's the, the real catalyst that, that brings all of this on. I mean, Henry, Henry I had more illegitimate children um, than any other monarch in, in English or British history. Um, he had 22 definite illegitimate sons and daughters and probably a few more that we're not quite certain about but only had one legitimate son and one legitimate daughter. So when his legitimate son um, is killed in a, in a boating accident, trying to race back um, from the French coast to, to England, uh, the, the ship tries to overtake his father's as it leaves port. It hits a, an exposed bit of rock that they can't see in the dark. Most of the crew and all the passengers are, are drunk by this point as well. Um, it's a, very much a lads on tour ship um, and it's chaos and, and the ship sinks there's there's no no survivors, uh, and Henry the first only son is is killed. Henry, I mean Henry by this point is uh, um, getting on a little bit, but he remarries to a younger woman in an effort to try and have another child. Um, but the longer things go on, the more he's faced with the reality that his only legitimate child now is a woman, and that even you know in the 12th century um, presents fairly significant problems for a woman to to try and rule in the position of a man. So um, Empress Matilda was set up to effectively become a female king. You know, queen would be the wrong word for what she was trying to do because queen was a very definite thing. Queen is a consort to a king uh, and has a very specific role. So what she's trying to be is a female king, but in a world where men can't relate to that, they don't know what that means. They don't know, you know, it's Game of Thrones stuff. How do you bend the knee to a woman? Um, how do you do what a woman tells you to do without being completely emasculated? So Empress Matilda faces all of these problems. And in many ways, Stephen's, the secret of Stephen's success is just being a man. He's on the scene. He's there. He's popular. He's well-liked. Um, and people just rush him through uh, almost as a way of avoiding having to deal with the problems that female kingship would bring. Um, but unfortunately for them, Empress Matilda wasn't one to give up quite so easily. I love that she was a fighter. Absolutely. I mean, she was, to some extent, her own worst enemy in that she was so inflexible sometimes. Um, but even as I say that, you know, I think a lot of what she does are actions that would have been admired and held up if they had been done by a man. 
So this is what people would expect a king to do, to be forceful about his rights, to, to fight for what he believed was his. Um, but when a woman does this, people don't quite know how to react. Um, and Empress Matilda is kind of stuck in this impossible catch-22 situation where if she moderates her behaviour, then she stops being what a king should be. If, if she tries to be a woman, she stops being a king. But if she carries on being a, what a king should be, she stops being what a woman should be. And she never managed to kind of reconcile those two, or rather the men around her never managed to reconcile those two opposing and conflicting views of the world. You know, a king was a different thing from a woman um, in the 12th century. And and they never managed to get over that in a way that would allow them to accept Matilda. So that every time she, she got close to power, I mean, she was within days of a coronation in London at one point, um, only for London to be attacked and her and her, her party to be driven out of the city you know and the chronicles tell us that they were in the middle of a feast and there was still warm food on the tables when the rebels break into their their property and everything you know they've left in that much of a hurry so she gets incredibly close and then everyone panics and throws it all away i love this story so much it's you know, like you know it repeats itself in history of the the battling for the throne you know who's going to be in power and matilda um was married to um oh, am i remembering Jeffrey Jeffrey of, correct Jeffrey yeah. yes and it was their heir then who became the next king of england that's it so um we arrive we arrive at this settlement where Geoffrey of anjou um is determined not to be involved in english politics but he, he does want to conquer Normandy. So he manages to get hold of Normandy and becomes Duke of Normandy while Matilda is in England. But I think if, eventually Matilda realises that the fact of her gender is an insurmountable issue. And she ends up taking a back seat. She kind of, that incident in London where she's driven out when she's so close to a coronation, that's kind of hard to come back from. And she reaches the point where she 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 realises that she's just not going to do it. But she doesn't give up. What she decides to do instead is to to keep her claim alive on behalf of her oldest son, uh, who is called Henry, named after his grandfather, Henry I. Um, and when he's old enough, Henry gets himself involved in, in the conflict that's going on. Um, he has a few sort of false starts and early forays into England. At one point, he, he launches an invasion with what looks like the disapproval of both his mother and his father and his uncle Robert, um, who all refuse to give him money when it all goes badly wrong and he can't afford to pay his men. Um, so strangely, Henry ends up going to Stephen and asking for the money to pay his soldiers off so that they can leave England. And Stephen you know, agrees to this uh, in what is often seen as kind of weakness and folly on Stephen's part. But what he actually does is not only get a hostile army out of his country, um, but I think he probably softens Henry's view of Stephen um, and the, the two of them can relate to each other on a chivalric level. They have that kind of understanding and appreciation of the chivalric code and what it means. You know, you don't have to hate the person that you're fighting. It doesn't have to be as personal as you might think it is. And I think probably that that softens the events over the following years. And Henry, you know, does get into the ascendancy and they eventually arrive at a, an agreement whereby Stephen will stay on the throne for the rest of his life. Um, but Henry will succeed him, uh, and Henry is effectively adopted by Stephen as his son. And then Stephen passes away within a year of that agreement being made. So, you know, maybe if it had gone on longer, it would have fallen apart. But as it was, Henry comes to the throne as the heir of the previous king in a fairly settled kingdom uh, and is able to start what becomes the Plantagenet dynasty, you know, 331 years of the most fascinating characters you can possibly imagine. I, I mean, I always say to people who are interested in the Tudors, anything that the Tudors did, the Plantagenets had done it before. They'd done it bigger and dirtier and nastier and better than, than the Tudors did. And, it, you know, the, his dynasty spans 331 years, ended at the Battle of Bosworth um, with the, the accession of Henry Tudor as Henry VII. Um, but really, you know, all across that Plantagenet era, it's so much going on, so much interesting stuff, so much about the forging of the England as a nation that the Tudors inherit, its separation from, from the continent, the identity of being English rather than being Normans who happen to rule England. All of that kind of stuff uh, happens under the Plantagenets and is, is the England that the Tudors acquire in 1485. 
you know, if we're going to go chronologically here, you also wrote a book on Henry the third who yeah. cr- correct me if I'm wrong. He was one, he was the son of King John. Absolutely. This is one of the things about Henry the third. No one knows who he was. Um, he's one of those monarchs that people struggle to place in history, you know, who, who was before him and who was after him. Um, and yet he ruled for 56 years, um, the longest reign of a medieval monarch. It wasn't beaten until I think George the fourth, I think one of the Georges um, of, the, of the Hanover dynasty and an incredibly important period in English history. So he's the oldest son of King John. Uh, and we all know that King John dies in, in 1216 in the aftermath of Magna Carta uh, and during a French invasion of England in which the French prince um, the Dauphin, their, their equivalent of the Prince of Wales, the heir to the throne. The French Dauphin has been invited by English barons to invade England and kick John off the throne. Um, and really the, the only available solution to that problem is John dying, uh, which he conveniently and considerately does. Probably the, the nicest, most competent thing he did in his entire life was to die on time. Um, but his son, Henry, then comes to the throne as a, a little boy, a nine-year-old boy, um, and it's that kind of innocence and detachment from his father's policies and government that allows Plantagenet kingship to continue, really. So it sucks all of the air out of the baron's uh, annoyance with John because John's not there anymore. This little boy can't be associated with his rule. He's not old enough to have been involved in John's policies or to be responsible for any of that. Um, and we also get, you know, William Marshall... Um, throughout this period, throughout the reign of Henry II, Richard I, King John, um, an absolute legend. If ever there was a medieval legend, it's William Marshall. And he steps up to the plate in his in his you know last years, I think he's in his 80s by this point. Um and he, you know, springs into action again um and acts as kind of Henry's protector, sort of regent, uh, looks after him, fights for him. um, And really, probably it's William Marshall is the main reason that that Magna Carta and its its more important actual, actually cousin, the the Charter of the Forests, um, actually are resurrected and put into action because it's William Marshall's way of of settling the barons down uh, and taking the fire out of their bellies is to kind of give them what they wanted from John, but which John had sort of given and then taken away. Um, and we get lots of interesting stuff going on during Henry's reign then. So he he desperately wants to try and win back the territories in France that his dad's lost. Um, but the stars never seem to align for him. You know, every time he prepares for war in France, the Welsh kick off. And then he prepares for war again and his barons somewhere else kick off and he prepares for war again and there's another problem. Um, so it never quite happens for him. We, we get an, another towering figure later in his reign, um, Simon de Montfort, who you knows marries Henry's sister, but then they have a fairly spectacular falling out and Simon ends up effectively taking Henry prisoner at the Battle of Lewis and trying to rule on Henry's behalf. Um Simon de Montfort is often held up as kind of the father of the English parliament. And some people will claim that this was the first instance in which elected members of parliament um, attended. So, you know, we get this image of Simon as the the father of democracy, but it's not true. They'd actually been elected members of parliament for for several decades before this happened. So the the novel thing about Simon de Montfort's parliament is it's the first one that's summoned without the, the will of the king, really. Simon summons it because he wants it to be there, not because Henry wants it to be there. Um, but Henry is is blessed. I mean, he's Henry seems like a really nice guy, um, but not the most effective warrior. But he's been blessed with a, a, a son in Prince Edward, who goes on to become Edward I, the famous Longshanks, the Hammer of the Scots. He's blessed with a son who does know how to fight. Uh, and it's Edward who comes to Henry's rescue. And at the Battle of Evesham, um, about a year after Lewis, he, he frees his father, Simon de Montfort is killed. Um, and then we get this period of settlement again. And I tried to characterise, Hen- because Henry III is someone who people don't really place very well in history. They don't see where he is. I see him very much as a bridge between the problems of John's reign uh, and the, the issues around Magna Carta, the unsettlement of the barons, the French invasion, all that kind of stuff. 
and at the end of his reign, you, you've got a kingdom in which his son is able to start conquering Wales and trying to conquer Scotland and, and rules a much more settled kingdom, um, which is moving much more towards being an English kingdom rather than being, let's say, you know, Normans who happen to be living in England. Uh, and I think Henry is kind of that bridge between that discord and disruption and that settled reign that Edward acquires. You know, I think about, we were talking about the Wars of the Roses earlier, and you're talking about Henry and his son, Edward, and then we move forward to Edward III, who it makes me wonder, you know, he had so many sons. Do you think that that was the problem that could have been the catalyst for the Wars of the Roses? Absolutely. I mean, you know, sibling rivalry is never a good thing in a house. I've, I've got six children and four of them still live at home. Um, and sibling rivalry is a, a daily problem for me. So I don't know how Henry, how Edward the Third coped. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so many sons. Um, I mean, it sounds awful, doesn't it, to say it now? But daughters are one thing. You marry them off for political allegiances. They don't tend to cause the kind of dynastic problems um, that your sons will cause. All, having said that, you know, the Yorkist claim to the throne ultimately comes through the Mortimer line, which is a, a line of female descent from Edward III, from uh, Edward III's second son, Lionel, Duke of Clarence, um, via his daughter. Um, so, yeah, we, we get lots and lots of problems with all of those sons. And when Edward III dies, you know, Edward the Black Prince, uh, Edward III's oldest son, has already passed away just before. So we get a little boy on the throne again with Richard II and all of the problems that come with the regency, with with several uncles who were squabbling. With there's lots of suspicion around John of Gaunt, um, who is the third son uh, of Edward III, that he planned to take the throne for himself. I mean, there's not really any evidence that he actually made any efforts to do that, but there seems to have been a lot of suspicion around him. People were eyeing him with a great deal of caution. He was an incredibly rich and powerful man, um, and he did seem to be taking steps to ensure that uh, the kind of French system of Salic law, which only allows the transmission of claims to the throne through the male line, could be instituted in England uh, and is credited with having a hand in Edward III's final settlement um, just before he passed away of the, the crown in the male line. So that Richard II obviously inherits and any of his sons, but after that it would effectively skip Philippa of Clarence, who is Lionel's daughter, and move on to John of Gaunt's line so he's sort of positioning his uh, children to be in line for the throne if richard the third uh, sorry richard the second doesn't have any children which as we know eventually happens and it's one of john of gaunt's sons henry the fourth who eventually boots richard off the throne uh, and takes the throne to begin the lancastrian dynasty but also you've got this kind of lingering um you know the, the, this family tree continues these branches dangle for an awful long time. So you've so you've still got Lionel's line carrying on through the Mortimers, who caused all sorts of problems during the early um, Lancastrian years. John of Gaunt's family obviously extends to include the Beauforts, um, who would be incredibly influential throughout the 15th century. Um, and then you've got the House of York, descended from Edward III's fourth son. Um, and that line eventually ends up in the hands of that title, sorry, eventually ends up in the hands of Richard, Duke of York, uh, who is the third Duke of York and the, the most famous one involved in the early phases of the Wars of the Roses. Uh, and even um, Edward III's youngest son, Thomas of Woodstock, he's, he's a descendant of the, the Dukes of Buckingham. Um, so, you know, when, when we get to 1483 and we look at the, the Duke of Buckingham rebelling against Richard III, it's potentially to, to champion his own claim to the throne, which still you know, harks all the way back to Edward III. Um, so it really did create problems, you know, not a problem that the Tudors tend to have, not too many of the children around. I mean, the closest you get, I guess, is Mary and Jane Grey um, having their their kind of conflict for the throne and the succession crisis there. Um, but really, by the time you get to the middle of the 15th century and the Wars of the Roses is brewing, almost every nobleman in England can somehow trace his line back to Edward III. Um, so you've got this situation where you've got dozens of men who might want to champion their claim to the throne or at least wouldn't want to have their noses put out of joint too far. This is a problem that Henry VIII wish he had. <laughs> too yeah. many sons. Yeah. Well, that's it. You know, I mean, sometimes you want to be careful what you wish for. I mean, Henry wanted sons, but having too many sons brings its own problems with it as well. I'm sure he considered having only daughters a problem and, you know, 
his entire focus was on achieving Edward the Sixth, wasn't it? Um, but if he'd had more sons, it might just have caused more problems. No doubt, definitely. And you briefly skimmed over Richard, Duke of York, who you also wrote a book about. Yeah, I love, love, love Richard, Duke of York. Um, he's probably up there with Richard III as my favourite historical character. Um, the biography of Richard, the, Richard, Duke of York is the one that I asked the publisher if I could write. So when they got in touch with me, they had a couple of ideas for books that they wanted me to write. And I agreed to do them on the basis that I could do a Richard, Duke of York biography um, kind of in between the ones that they wanted me to do. Because I think he's just such a fascinating man who is so completely misunderstood. And I think he suffers in the same way that Richard III does. We're kind of bequeathed by traditional history, this image of, of Richard, Duke of York and Richard III kind of sprouting out of the ground just for the purposes of causing trouble um, and, and claiming the throne and disrupting the country. Um, you know, as if their previous lives hadn't happened, as if Richard III wasn't 30 when he came to the throne and hadn't, you know, spent more than a decade running almost half the country on behalf of his brother and fighting wars against Scotland uh, and all that kind of thing. And all of the policies that we can see during his lifetime. And Richard, Duke of York, I think, is exactly the same. This is a man who had spent decades being completely and utterly loyal to the Lancastrian regime. Uh, he had served as lieutenant in France twice. So he had effectively run the British possession, the, the English possessions in France uh, at a point where England uh, almost had control of half of France. You know, he comes to, to the post just after we've lost Paris um, back to the French. So, But during his time in charge, it's incredibly settled. It's incredibly well organised. I tend to characterise him as an incredibly capable administrator rather than uh, a very good soldier. Um, and in this, I think his image is, is aligned with Richard III. You know, we tend to get images of them both as warlike soldiers, but their military records aren't really, they're not really that good um, and probably not as extensive as people think they are either. So I think Richard, Duke of York, um, having served the Lancastrian regime in this way, becomes kind of a victim of his own bloodline, again, going all the way back to Edward III, because not only is he descended from the House of York, but his mother is Anne Mortimer, who is descended from Philippa of Clarence, Lionel Duke of Clarence, that line that potentially has a better claim to the English throne than the Lancastrians do, but which the Lancastrians have made efforts to, to exclude. And although Edward III makes provisions for that, um, there's a long history in England of, of kings not being able to control things from beyond the grave um, in the ways that they would like to. And Henry VIII is the, is the massive exception to that, isn't he? I mean, he does an incredible job of tying things up uh, <laughs> after he's gone um, in ways that no other monarch had managed to do. Henry V's will is completely and utterly ignored uh, when he dies in 1422. Um but in, in, in 1447, Henry VI is kind of growing a little bit more paranoid, uncertain about what's going on, worried about what's happening. I think people are whispering in his ears uh, and encouraging him. And he suddenly decides that his 56-year-old his uncle, uh, Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, um, who is childless, uh, Henry suddenly seems, seems to become convinced that Humphrey wants to take his throne from him. Uh, and in 1447, Humphrey is effectively placed under arrest. He has what is suspected to be a stroke, although obviously there's lots of talk of it being poison and murder at the time. Uh, and Humphrey dies. But Humphrey, I mean, Henry VI caught by this point is incredibly polarised and factional in a way that Henry VI just can't control. Uh, I mean, the, one of the key roles of a medieval king is to keep a lid on any conflicts at co court and control your nobility. But Henry's court is is torn apart by factions. And the two main ones really are led by uh, Cardinal Henry Beaufort, who is Henry VI's great uncle, um, and his Bishop of Winchester. And Henry really favours the, the peace policies um, that Henry VI is very attracted to. So he encourages the king in this. Um, and Henry has uh, trade links to the wool trade um, on the continent and things like that, which would be better served by peace than they are by war. Uh, Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, is kind of the leader of the other faction, uh, and he is 100% committed to the war in France. He wants to keep fighting, keep pushing, and eventually he, his ultimate aim is to fulfil what Henry V had envisaged for the Lancastrian regime, which is 
the crown of France as well as the crown of England. That policy becomes unpopular at court and amongst the nobility. Um, and probably quite rightly, the, the war with France is becoming almost impossible to finance. We can't find enough men to fight it all the time either. Um, and it just doesn't seem to be a fight that we can really win anymore. But it's also incredibly popular in England in the 15th century to fight the French. So, you know, the people want it. The people want a good scrap with the French. So Humphrey is incredibly popular with the people, even though his policies are kind of out of step with what's happening at Henry's court. Um, so when Humphrey dies, he his support transitions quite fluidly, quite easily to Richard, Duke of York. Um, Richard, Duke of York is, is someone who ha had been sidelined a little bit Despite being involved in France and everything like that, he's never really been at the core of government. And I think that's probably not helped by this Mortimer blood that he has and the suspicion of his claim to the throne. So Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, had kind of co-opted York to his populist cause. Um, and there's nowhere, nowhere I found ever, ever any evidence that York kind of approved of this or wanted this, but Humphrey does it anyway. Um, so that when Humphrey dies, all of that support um, and the populist feeling that we should continue the war with France kind of transitions to Richard, Duke of York and lands in his lap. And unfortunately for him, along with all of that populist support comes all of the suspicion from Henry VI court that you're up to something. Um, and Richard, Duke of York is a, a younger man than Humphrey. And in comparison at this point to Henry VI, who is childless, York has a, a fairly large brood of children, um, which is ever increasing. He's proved himself an incredibly capable governor and ruler in a way that Henry VI is unable to do. So even without York doing anything, he starts to become perceived as a threat to Henry VI, which makes him even more marginalised. Um, so I, 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 despite his kind of decades of service and his solid support of the Lancastrian regime, he's kind of pushed aside because of the blood in his veins and who his mother was. Um and that becomes kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy then, I think. So the more Henry pushes him away, the more York resists and pushes back and feels like he has to defend his, his rights and his position. And the more he does that, the more aggressive he looks and the more Henry seeks to push him away. And you end up in this vicious cycle that literally becomes a vicious cycle of, of fighting and war and battle until it erupts in civil war. Well, and we have the same problem with Richard, Duke of York. He had four sons that were living at, at one point, who then, of course, Edmund died early on in the wars. And then we're left with Edward, who became Edward IV. And then we have the problem with uh, the middle son, who's remaining, would be George. Yeah. Um, and you throw in the kingmaker in there and Richard III, and it just becomes a big mess again. Well, that's it. You know, you're talking about giant personalities again. Uh, all arriving at the same time. Um, Edward IV is the, the, the tallest man ever to sit on the throne of England or Britain at six foot four. Um, a, a fair giant of a man and a beast on the battlefield. You know, he's undefeated in battle during the Wars of the Roses and, and very, very few people can say that. So yeah, his, his next brother Edmund dies at the Battle of Wakefield alongside his dad, Richard, Duke of York um, in 1460. Um, when Edmund is just 17. So we're left then with George, who a lot of the problems, I think, with George sprout from the fact that when Edward comes to the throne, he, he's again, young man, unmarried, childless. Um, and George is, is effectively Edward's heir. And that persists for several years. Uh, Edward IV doesn't have a son until 1471. So you've got kind of 10 years of his reign in which George considered himself Edward's heir, quite rightly, he was the next next oldest male of the House of York. But George seems dissatisfied with with second playing second second fiddle to Edward. He's never very good at, at you know being in the background. He wants it all for himself, um, and he seems to have developed this incredible sense of self importance and entitlement, which is fueled by uh, Richard Neville, the Earl of Warwick, the Kingmaker. Uh, who effectively falls out with Edward over all sorts of things. I mean, traditionally, again, we're told that this is all about Edward's marriage to Elizabeth Woodville. Um, and doubtless, uh, Warwick wasn't happy about Edward marrying um, what he would have considered an incredibly unsuitable bride, particularly when Warwick is in the midst of, of negotiating a marriage to a French princess. So this is 
also embarrassing on a personal level for Warwick. Um, but at least one of the Chronicles specifically tells us that isn't the reason that Warwick fell out with Edward. It was more to do with policy, foreign policy. Warwick favoured alliances with France and the French king, uh, whereas Edward ended up favouring uh, alliances with Burgundy, uh, egged on in that by the Woodvilles. Um, and that was really at the core of where they fell apart. And also, I think, because Warwick was the an older... I mean, they were first cousins, but Warwick was um, nearly 10 years older. Edward, as a young man, comes to the throne, needs a guiding hand. But as Edward starts to grow up and wants to take control of things himself, that means there's no other way to deal with Warwick but to start pushing him away a little bit. So exactly as, as Edward's father had been, Warwick starts to be pushed away, and the more he pushes back, the more he looks aggressive, and the more Edward pushes him away, and you end up repeating the cycle of 10 years earlier, and Warwick ends up in opposition, and he, he sucks George in, I think probably plays to George's vanity, um, tells George that he ought to be king in place of Edward, and that's where the rebellion starts. Although when that doesn't work out, Warwick manages to make a an alliance with the deposed Henry VI's wife, Margaret of Anjou, to restore Henry VI to the throne, which, again, you know, means George is shunted further down the line. Um, George is made the heir to Henry VI's son if Henry VI's son doesn't have any children. So going from being the, the aim, uh, Warwick's rebellion having the aim of putting George on the throne, it suddenly changes to, to George being pushed further and further down the, the line of succession, which is where he was finding himself in his brother's court, except that then his brother was king and his family was in charge and not the Lancastrians who hated the Yorks by this point. So George's position kind of gets worse and worse and worse. Um, and Edward is, is, is driven out of the country. Edward IV is driven out of the country into exile. Uh, Henry VI is restored to the throne for, for nine months kind of thing before Edward invades again. Um, and one of the interesting aspects of this is that we're told in a lot of the chronicles that there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes to try and bring George back into the fold. I mean, George is, is an incredibly powerful and rich nobleman who can put an awful lot of men into the field. Um, so he is a threat to Edward, but we're told that most of the legwork, most of the work to try and bring George back on side is done by the female members of the House of York. Um, so their mother, Cecily Neville, um, but, but also their sisters, uh, Margaret, the Duchess of Burgundy, Elizabeth, the Duchess of Suffolk. Um, they're all working incredibly hard to bring George back on side. Um, and when they end up meeting, their armies meet um, when Edward is travelling south back towards London. And we're then told it's kind of Richard, the youngest brother, who steps in and makes the personal appeal to, to George um, that eventually brings George back on side. So it's very much a team effort to bring George back into the fold. Um and then, yeah, we've got Richard, you know, the youngest brother, um, seems to cause absolutely no trouble for the vast majority of his life, serves Edward incredibly well in the north, um, and then kind of explodes onto the, the scene in 1483 um, in a mess that we struggle to understand today in terms of, of motive and everything else, but ends up uh, as king, and then two years later loses the Battle of Bosworth and ends the 331-year Plantagenet dynasty. I have two very important questions for you. The okay. first the first one is, did Richard III have anything to do with the princes in the tower? Wow. I, I, I'm going to pretend my mic's breaking up. No, can I make some <laughs> weird noises now? Um, I mean, I, I will always concede that if you were launching a murder inquiry, Richard III is going to be your prime suspect. Um if you believe the boys, we know they disappeared. If you believe they're dead, then I think Richard III has to be a prime suspect in terms of his, his motive, his means and his opportunity. He's the man who, who has custody of them. He's the king of the, the country. He's in a position to do it. They are a potential threat to his position. Um, if not immediately, then definitely in the future. Um, so he can fulfil all of those criteria. We get other suspects, Henry Stafford, the Duke of Buckingham, who ends up rebelling against Richard in 1483. I love to annoy everybody by saying that Margaret Beaufort, I think, has to be on the list uh, as a potential <laughs> suspect, um, just for the eye rolls and the boos. Um, I'm sorry if people have turned your podcast off now. Um, <laughs> but I just don't think you can discount um, 
anybody who was in London during that period. I mean, the, the Duke of Norfolk seems to have appeared at the forefront of some people's arguments now. Uh, John Howard um, as a potential suspect in the murder of the princes in the tower. But I mean, obviously, I wrote a book called The Survival of the Princes in the Tower. So I guess that probably tells you where I'm going to come at this argument from. Um I, I honestly don't believe that those boys were in danger from Richard III during 1483 and 1484 um, and 1485, indeed, through his reign. I just, if you look at the, the 30 years of that man's life before he comes to the throne, there is absolutely no hint of a man whose first response to any kind of a crisis is to murder anybody, let alone to murder children and let alone to murder the children of a brother who he loved and had served for all of his life. I mean, when um, Richard, Duke of York, dies in 1460, um, Richard and George are, are sent off into exile as little boys on their own. Um, they have a few servants that go with them, but but literally, you know, it's the two of them holding hands in a, a boat going across the channel in the dark and the freezing cold when their dad's just died. I can't imagine much more terrifying that Richard's eight at this point. Um, and when he... You know, he's, he's in exile for a little while. Eventually, news arrives that Edward IV has taken the throne in 1461, and there Richard and George are brought back for the coronation. And we're told that Edward has these has the two boys, these two little brothers, placed in a household in London, but that he visits them every single day uh, to check up on them, to make sure they have everything that they need. And so he becomes this kind of constant presence in Richard's life at a difficult time, and like a father figure. You know, he's Edward's, what, a decade older than than Richard, this physically physical giant of a man who now becomes a giant presence in Richard's life. And I find it hard to believe that that from that start you would get to a point a few years later where you want to kill this person's children. Um, we don't have any example during the 30 years of Richard's life of him acting uh, unreasonably, killing anybody, executing anyone in any in any way that's seen as as um, unlawful or immoral. Um, so um, it amazes me that people are so quick to believe that in 1483 he arrived in London and thought, well, now I'm going to be king. Well, now I'm king. I better kill some children. Um, I just don't see that line of argument. And if you want to make the line of argument about killing the two boys because they were a threat to his throne, then you have to wonder why Richard wouldn't kill Edward IV's daughters. They become an active threat to his throne. You know, from 1483 onwards, Elizabeth of York is the, the centre of Henry Tudor's plots to take the throne because he promises to marry her to try and secure Yorkist support for his attempts on the throne. So she's an active threat um, for two years uh, of Richard III's life, and yet he does absolutely nothing to her. Um, if you count up uh, uh, Richard III, when he comes to the throne on the day of his accession has 17 nieces and nephews, if you ignore the princes in the tower. Uh, and on the day that he dies at the Battle of Bosworth, he still has 17 nieces and nephews uh, who survive to the end of his reign, completely untouched. Um, Edward, Earl of Warwick, the son of George Duke of Clarence, who's often held up as having a better claim to the throne than Richard, though he's legally uh, removed from the line of succession by his father's attainder, specifically removes his children from the line of succession. Um, but Edward is being rehabilitated. He's being placed in the Council of the North at the head of it. He's being kind of trained up for government. Why would you do this to a boy who is as much of a threat as Edward the Fourth's sons are, really? Um, John de la Pole, the Earl of Lincoln, who is their oldest nephew, um, arguably has the, the kind of next best Yorkist claim to the throne. His, his mother is uh, Richard and Edward the Fourth's sister, Elizabeth, the, Duke, uh, the Duchess of Suffolk. Um, so he would be claiming through the female line, but as we mentioned before, the entire Yorkist claim to the throne is based on a female line of descent. Um, you know, John de la Pole, again, is, is put in charge of the Council of the North, um, is running large swathes of England on behalf of Richard, um, and is completely and utterly unharmed. So if Richard is going to kill two children, why do you leave the other 17 alone? Wouldn't it make more sense to just leave all 19 of your nieces and nephews alone? And I think Richard had lots and lots and lots of options if he didn't want to to murder his nephews straight off. Um, and I mean, a good example comes from the kind of Mortimer story again. So when Henry Henry the Fourth comes to the throne, um, Richard the Second's 
possible heir presumptives. It's not entirely clear who sits where in the line of succession during a lot of these crises. Um, but many people viewed the Mortimers as Richard II's uh, heirs presumptive. So Edmund Mortimer um, was a child when Henry IV took the throne. Um, and Henry IV takes uh, Edmund and his little brother Roger um, into initially into a loose form of custody. Um, but they're, they're fairly quickly sprung out, actually, by the York family, uh, with the plan of getting them to Wales and having Edmund crowned as king to replace Henry IV. They don't make it very far, and they're very quickly recovered. But then both the boys kind of disappear. Um, no one knows where they are. Uh, the suspicion now is that they were moved around lots and lots of royal castles. But very much as happened in Richard III's reign, they just vanish. People stop talking about them, and no one knows where they are. And then when Henry IV dies in 1413, one of the first things that Henry V does is to bring them out. Uh, and Edmund is given the Earldom of March, the Mortimer family title. He's given all of his lands and his money and is allowed to live his life. And, you know, he lives until 1425 when he dies um, serving the House of Lancaster in Ireland. So if Richard is looking for a fairly recent template for how, you know, how do you deal with two young boys who might have a potential claim to your throne, he's got it laid out for him there you cut out the bit with the initial loose custody where they're able to be uh, sprung out and used against you and you simply make them vanish but not in a sinister way in a in a way that means you're protecting them um, and you're protecting yourself so richard has countless castles in the north from his his more than a decade ruling the north midland sheriff hutton barnard castle um, all of these that are filled with men who are incredibly loyal to Richard and who he knows incredibly well. He's got his sister, Margaret, who is the sister who is closest in age to him. She's just older than George. So the three of them were brought up together at Fotheringay Castle in Northampton and spent an awful lot of time together. So Margaret is quite close to Richard and she's the, the Dowager Duchess of Burgundy by this point. So he's got a whole continental court that he could send one or both of the boys to. Um, so I, I just don't buy the argument that Richard's first solution to a crisis in 1483 is to go in a child murdering spree. So then my next loaded question is, <laughs> what, <laughs> was Henry VII a usurper? Um, in the sense that most medieval kings were, then yes, absolutely. Henry VII was definitely a usurper. I mean, he he won the, the crown in battle rather than acquiring it by succession. Um, but depending on the definition of usur usurpation that you use, I think mean, you can make an argument for an awful lot of medieval kings being usurpers. I mean, you start at William the Conqueror, and obviously, you know, he conquers the kingdom and takes the throne. Um, we'll let his son William the Second off, but then you've got Henry the First, who was um, the third son, uh, and who stole the throne from his older brother Robert, and then fought a series of battles with his brother Robert in order to keep that throne. Uh, immediately after Henry the First, you get Stephen, as we talked about before in the anarchy. You know, his nephew um, steals the throne in spite of the fact that Empress Matilda was named as the heiress. Um, Henry II, you know, succeeds, um, and you've got uh, Richard I. But then you could talk about John. I mean, there's there's lots of contention over whether John had a the rightful claim to the throne, or it was his nephew Arthur, who John is accused of murdering. Um, so potentially John's a usurper there. Um, and then you can skip ahead and look at Edward III. You know, he he his father is kicked off the throne. Um, so he doesn't do the usurping, I guess, because he's young. Um, but then Henry IV usurps Richard II immediately after Edward III's reign. Um, and then uh, Edward IV usurps Henry VI throne. Henry VI usurps it back. Edward IV usurps it back again. Um, and Richard III, I mean, you know, all you can say for Richard III is that at least he follows a kind of legal mechanism um, in order to do this. He takes the, he claims the throne, or, or rather he is asked to take the throne, um, after the children of Edward IV have been declared legally illegitimate. So whether you believe that Richard lied and drove that action through or whether it was in fact true uh, and it was the, the authorities in London that were doing the legwork and it, it was them who actually declared Edward IV's children to be illegitimate and then asked Richard to become king as the, the only available legitimate rightful heir of the House of York. So I think you can make a stronger argument for Richard III not being a usurper than most other medieval monarchs, yet he's one of the very few, probably him and, and Henry IV, who are really always labelled as usurpers. Um, but definitely Henry VII 
fits the the definition of usurper who takes the throne by force um, when it isn't his. Um, but it's no worse than an awful lot of monarchs have done before him. And you know, I I'm not a Ricardian who hates Henry the Seventh. Um, Henry the Seventh. There's an awful lot of parallels between Richard III's life and Henry VII's life. You talk about, you know, losing parents young, spending time in exile. Obviously, Henry Tudor's is an awful long, much more long time. Um, but coming to the throne when you wouldn't have been expected to, there's an awful lot of parallels there. Um, and despite the way in which I think the Battle of Bosworth has been traditionally set up as this incredibly personal fight between Richard and Henry, who hated each other's guts, you know, they'd never met each other. It's one of those things where it's it's a battle, but it's not a personal fight between Richard and Henry on a, the level of their personalities. Obviously, they both want the throne and they're fighting over it. Um, but Richard and Henry didn't know each other to hate each other. Henry was a, a man like Richard was, I think, living an incredibly difficult and tumultuous time in English history, just trying to make his way the best he possibly can. And Henry happens to end up being in a position where people are, are pushing him forward for the throne and he, he goes for it. Um, and quite incredibly and, and quite impressively wins against all of the odds and becomes king. So yes, he's a usurper. I think he's more of a usurper than Richard III is, um, but I don't necessarily hold that against him. Will you leave your email address so all the hate mail can come directly to you? <laughs> Absolutely. It's uh, whose email can address can I give you? I give you Nathan Ammon's email address. <laughs> He's going to be on in a couple of weeks here, so I guess um, you two uh, just can't just tell get... you the exact opposite of what I've told you. I wouldn't bother having him on. I could tell you what he'll say. Richard definitely killed the princes. Henry the Seventh was brilliant. I love it. I love it so much. Uh, you know here's sorry. I'm, I'm just going to say that my my friendship with Nathan, I absolutely love because we disagree about every single thing that you could possibly think about in life from from politics to to history to everything every every single thing we disagree about but i consider him a really good friend you know we never fall out we discuss stuff um but we we never we never get nasty we never fall out with each other we respect each other's views um and i think i just think there needs to be a bit more of that in the world um but also i think it, there's a danger in kind of living in your own echo chamber and only hearing the opinions of people who agree with you um, and never having your opinions challenged. How do you know your opinions are right if you never examine them and challenge them? Um, so I think that's that's a lot of what I get out of Nathan, um, as well as funny drunk posts on Facebook. Your relationship with Nathan is the model for my relationship with Janet Wertman because we are on <laughs> opposing side on the Seymour brothers. So. Yeah. I look to the civility that you two have with each other and use that as an example of, hey, let's talk about it. Let's show what we have. And then we can still disagree at the end. Yeah, that's nice. And we, you know, we literally, the princes in the tower is a prime example. I think Nathan is convinced that Richard III killed them, although he has his arguments for why that wasn't necessarily such a bad decision on Richard's part. Um, I just don't believe that they were killed in 1483. Um, when I started giving talks on the Survivor of the Princes in the Tower book, I used to, to stand up and I would confidently say, I'm here to tell you that the princes in the tower didn't die at all until someone put their hand up at one of the early talks and said, uh, they probably have died by now. <laughs> I love it. OK, yeah, I'll moderate what I say a little bit. So, yeah, so I have to be careful to say that they weren't killed in 1483. Um, so, you know, we disagree about that and we can we can both look at exactly the same piece of evidence and we can draw diametrically opposed conclusions from that piece of evidence and we can disagree about it without shouting at each other swearing at each other hating each other and never talking to each other again and i think that's that's something that a lot of the world seems to have lost at the moment well, on a little a lighthearted end to this podcast, I have to ask you the question that I ask all of my guests, and okay. I'm intrigued, and I have to feel like I know where you're going to go with this, but I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you anyway. If I could give you a time machine, Matthew, with the guarantee of a safe return, where and when would you choose to tra travel? Yeah, I think the the princes in the tower one is obvious, isn't it? You know, head to the Tower of London in 1483. But there's there's so much else going on in that year, just around. Could I sneak a look at the evidence that Richard puts out about the pre-contract, which said that Edward IV was married before he married Elizabeth Woodville. Um, so therefore, you know, his second marriage is bigamous. 
and all of the children are illegitimate. That's the basis on which the princes are excluded. Because all of the chronicles tell us that, that that evidence is examined in London in 1483 by the nobility and the gentry and the aldermen and the officials in London. And they all accept that evidence and believe that it's true. But because it doesn't exist today, we're so quick to dismiss it. Um, and again, you know, I find that odd um, that we will say that it's false, even though people who saw it say it was true. Um but crikey, I don't know. You know what? I I think I'd love to. Well, coming back to my most recent book, you know, I could pop back and see Empress Matilda, um, and I, I'd love to have a discussion with her. I think about whether she thinks she could have or should have moderated her tactics, um, especially around eleven fourteen, eleven forty one, when Stephen ends up getting captured, um, and she gets that that kind of almost gets to her coronation in London. But the the chronicles criticise her for acting in such an unwomanly way and behaving too much like a man um, so that, you know, they found it almost impossible to follow her, but doing the exact things that they would expect from a man king. Um, so I think, you know, Empress Matilda had this kind of option of behaving in a way that that men recognised as a woman or behaving as a man in a way that a king needed to behave, but but wouldn't, would be challenging for the nobility to accept. And I, I would want to know, did she ever try and think about whether there was a middle road there i suspect that she would probably say go away i'm the king uh you know why should i moderate myself just because men don't know how to deal with that and she'd be quite right um but she might have had a bit more political success if she tried to find this kind of middle road i think i think i need to build this time machine because there's going to be a lot of us traveling back yeah, I definitely need a TARDIS where we can all fit inside in one go. <laughs> I love it. Matthew, how can our listeners find you and your books? Uh, I'm, I'm on Twitter all the time, at Matt Lewis Author. Uh, I'm also on Facebook, um, at Matt Lewis Author as well. Um, my books are available on Amazon, um, or uh, they're published either by Amberley, um, the History Press, or Pen and Sword, so they're available from their websites as well. Thank you so much for being on the show with me today. I appreciate it's been it. A pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. And that concludes this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. You can find my show notes from this episode and how to become a patron at tutorsdynastypodcast.com. Don't want to miss an episode? Be sure to subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Patreon, or Podbean. Intro and outro music called Folk Round by Kevin McLeod and Competech.com. Creative Commons license via filmmusic.io. Thanks for checking out the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Read more. Read more on the blog at TudorsDynasty.com. Follow Tudor's Dynasty on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to Tudor's Dynasty on iTunes. Thanks for listening.